This is the second tape of selections from tapes made at the two-day silent workshop with Bartholomew in Santa Cruz, California, March 27 and 28, 1993. One of the hallmarks of a truly enlightened one, and they said it in Christ, and they said it in Buddha, and they said it in them, they said it in all of them, is to be able to look on whatever is considered either good or evil and find only love and compassion in response. It is very easy to have love and compassion for loving people. It is quite different to have love and compassion for someone who is so out of balance that violence is their response to life. Your job, my friends, is to feel your own connection. Nothing happens in this world on the human plane that you are not in some way connected with. That does not mean you prayed for it and wanted it. It means it is connected to you in some way. And when you claim that fragment within yourself with honesty and integrity, when you allow yourself to feel your rage and your anger and your own violent response, in that simple acceptance, something begins to happen and you can begin to change the energy within you around that accepting and as a response, this is very important, as a response, that is what goes out to help to soften all of that violence. Your violence in opposition to it is not going to do it. If it is what you want to do, then do it. I am not trying to preach anything uh, to be a pacifist. To be a pacifist outside and to be angry in one's heart is I mean, it's nonsense. You simply claim where you stand, claim your own humanness. This scares me. I would do anything to stop this happening, to including inflicting harm. All I ask is that you admit to this. I am not asking that you do anything other in the admitting to where you connect with a universal, ongoing human condition, you begin to understand. And when you understand yourself, you begin to understand other, and the movement begins, and that is how the violence is going to stop. There is no other way. Now, that part of your egos that has been trained to take care of itself, to take care of what it's, what it's, it's, it's offspring. <coughs> You've been trained, it's, it's in the cells, my friends, it's there. That part that says, I'll do what I have to do, I'll do whatever I have to do. These are mine, these are my cubs back here, and I'm taking care of them. <laughs> I'm not, that's in you. You know, in the end, you have to realize you do come along from that lineage, don't you? You are, part, you, are part, you are part of the animal kingdom, and that is part of it. And, and so, it's not that you have to stop it. How are you going to stop it? Oh, yes, go ahead. Here, I'm going to help you take them. You know, I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about being honest. That's all that's required. And in the claiming, yes, I am furious, yes, to yourself, you begin to understand. And the thing that brings clarity and ends violence is understanding. It is an energy field of clarity. We're talking about clear light, clear understanding. And it has the motion to go out and make changes. So you have to ask yourself, uh, do you really want to stop the violence? And if you do, you begin by understanding the violence within you. On a small enough scale, it doesn't have to be worldwide, just where you are. Claiming your own. Out of that, compassion and out of that and if enough of you begin and push with that kind of intention what's going to arise is a thought form that is free of the past that has the potential to stop the violence you only have one mode now who's winning you are a combative race and that's the way it is and it's all right it's all right out of this combative race is going to arise some tremendous light. And this light and this power and this wonder is going to bring forth thought forms that can end the violence. But you're going to have to move out of the limitations. 
You're going to have to get to a vaster level. And if you really want to stop the violence on this planet, my friends, you can do it. But you cannot do it by legislation. You cannot do it by power over. You're going to have to do it in the only way that it can be done, which is to see and create and become aware of a thought form that transcends the limited ideas of global life that you have now. Is it there? Yes. Is it available? Yes. And how do you help? You begin with yourself. And so there is this loss. There is a sense of something deeply safe and important and essential from one's life is now gone. And what then does one do? Another question was, is there any point to sorrow? Is there any point to grief? We have to come at these questions, which are the deep questions of consciousness. You know, it's no good to talk about a loving God if in your own life you do not experience a loving God. It's no good to talk about great concepts if they do not intermesh and live in your life. Now. When we talk about relationships, we have to realize that where you stand now in your cultural lives is that you have constructed a social fabric which states that your safety is interdependent on other people loving you. And if other people love you, you will be safer. And so, and you begin this as very young children and it continues on through your life. Now, there comes a time when one is jolted into the understanding that the kind of love that one had counted on, that one had thought one could rely upon, is not always presented in the form that is most pleasing to the heart. And there comes a sense of not being safe anymore. Many of you have woken up as children under certain circumstances and realized fully and completely, I am not safe. And then the motion out to try to get some form outside of yourself to bring you the safety. I want to say to those of you who are grieving deeply in the heart for this kind of loss, and everyone in this room has suffered loss of one kind or another. You know that wonderful story. You know, there's no household in all of the world that there has not been sorrow and loss and grief. Now, when you look at this subject, you can say, it's because we have been bad in our past and we are karmically paying the score. Well, if that softens the blow in your heart, then say it. I don't happen to believe it, but if you believe it, fine. There is another way of looking at loss and sorrow and grief. And to know that there are no mistakes, there is simply knowing deeply that whatever moves into one's life somehow is in some mysterious way that one does not yet understand is totally appropriate. And that the pain and the, and the grief and the loss, somehow, please hear this, that pain, that feeling of grief, instead of trying to run away from it to somehow soften it, to somehow make it less through whatever method one might choose, I am asking something quite different. I am asking for a heroic and total full allowing of the experience. I'm asking you to call in that pain and that grief in its fullest form. Because when you get in deep rapport with those powerful energies that arise in every human being's life, you are closer to the God self than you are at other times. 
you understand, most of you just spend your life in kind of a medium kind of a range. But then all of a sudden, something comes in. Some, it comes in at both ends of the scale. Sometimes it comes in in that incredible falling in love until you're crazy. That's that feeling. Then you move to the other end of the scale, and often it's the same person and the same connection that took you from that feeling, and now here you are, and you're over here, and now what are you in? You're in total despair. Well, now most of you are in the middle. Oh, well, I don't care. Let him come. Let him go. It's all right. No. <laughs> well, I'll take it this way, that way, that person. You know, it's that mediocre feeling that you don't want, what you really want. And I know that you will say, no, no, I'd rather have this mediocre feeling. I will tell you that incredible pulsating pain of loss is close to that raw edge. It's close to that edge because it is that kind of real cellular visceral pain that pushes you to the determination to find a place where there is no pain. And it will push you and it will push you. Am I suggesting you all go out and get miserable? No, I'm not. I'm simply saying that in your life, when those moments come, and they do come, and they will come, and they have happened, and they must come, a life that is lived without those valleys is not worth living. So the idea in life is not to have a life that somehow is going to be all happy. The idea is to live with up and down of the living that goes with it. To be a human is to lose and to gain. It is to smile and it is to cry. It is to have and it is to have not. It is all of it. And it isn't like you're going to hang on and do this life right and then someday you'll be happy. In the midst of the mess and in the midst of the happiness, there has to be something in it as it is, and that is life. And as these pulsating moments of tremendous power come, I know I'm asking something very difficult, but you've got to really be grateful in some bizarre, mysterious way, you have to find that place inside that says, this is energy. This is absolute, powerful energy. Now what am I going to do with it? So, what do you do with it? I ask you, again and again, especially in the first weeks of this, to absolutely, and I'm sorry to use the words, and I don't mean them in any uh, disparaging way, to really wallow in the feeling. And do not try to be brave, do not try to be strong, do not try to be anything but totally what you are. To just be it, to feel it, to yell it, to write it, to experience it, to visualize it, to truly merge with that pain. Not think about it now, what do I mean? I mean something very... May I have uh, you for a moment, please? I want something very specific. Hmm? Very specific. Instead of just a general feeling of misery and thinking about why one is miserable, I want you to take it and translate it into an absolute physical experience. I want you to feel the tension in your jaw. I want you to feel all of the pain, all the constriction. I want you, don't name it. Don't name it as pain. Just feel it as a heaviness. Feel it as heat. Feel it as cool when it comes in. I want you to just interface with it on the cellular level, not with ideas. You will understand things on a cellular level when you allow the cells, you know, feel it. You've got to feel it. You've got to feel the throbbing in the throat. Do you understand? I want this on a cellular visceral level like you've never done it before. And when you find yourself going to your mind for understanding and for explanation, that is not where, that is not where illumination lies. It does not lie in ideas. It lies in the fact of what you are experiencing every moment. And the more that you stay with that and out of your mind, the more you stay with the feeling of that breath, the tightness here, the tightness here, the feeling up here, all of it, every moment, if you stay out of your thoughts and stay into how this body feels, you're going to begin to crack it. And in that, something else is going to arise. I am not saying you're going to run around with a great smile on your face. 
not for a while, but you are going to have a light in your mind over the event, over your, please hear this, over your selection of this event, of your selection of this event, because that is what you need to know. Not anybody else's, yours. Why, out of all the choices, did you, in your totality, select this event? Understand? The mind will make you squirrely crazy. The mind will not answer. It cannot answer. The mind is not set up to answer these questions then what is? The matrix in, in its embracing of the, of the energy of what is. We back to this morning. Remember I told you the matrix could, deal, matrix could deal with anything if you gave it something real. Now when you're in your mind fantasizing, I should have done this, I shouldn't have done this, why did I do this, blah, blah. Do you understand that mind? That what if mind. And if I had done, and though, those are all nothing. The matrix is saying, we're not getting anywhere. We're going to be stuck here because none of that is real. It's an idea in the future, in the past. You're just making up stories. What do you know? There's only one thing you know. Your body is shaking. Your body is tense. Your mind is hot. Your breath is shallow. Your buttocks are tight. Your toes are curling. That's all you know. The rest is just hyperbole. Speculation, storytelling, but grief doesn't go away by storytelling. So when you allow the matrix to blend with, and that means when you put, you see, the awareness is the, is the vehicle of the matrix. So whenever you put awareness, just pay attention, that's it, that's where this big word, what does it mean? It means what's happening. It means what's happening. It means what's happening. Your hands are under the faucet. They feel hot. The water's on them. Your feet are on the floor. The more moments that you stay in the moment just like that, like you did at lunch, tasting the food, differentiating the taste, looking at what you're seeing, just really, truly, simply seeing, and not allow yourself to go to the mind and create stories the matrix will do the healing. The matrix will do the healing. It is the matrix that brings about either the healing of the situation or, which is just as exciting, the total understanding of your part of the situation. And as these miracles, seemingly miracles, unfold, you begin to realize that you trust this matrix and in the moment presents the answers that you've been seeking. The matrix is filled with the light. And when the light touches the constrictions, mental, emotional, and physical, an actual release takes place. Just like bringing two things together, they combine, energy is released. By the same token, when you take awareness and just in its simplicity, place it on the problem, things begin to change. There was a question about someone who has a recurring uh, problem with fatigue. And the question is, how does one really deal with this? Does one resign oneself and say, all right, this is, this is my destiny? Uh, does one scurry around trying to find a solution? The answer, again, has to be the experience of you when you are in the midst of the fatigue without any thinking and fancy talking, explanations, nothing, plus the matrix, just staying totally and completely with 
the physical feeling of it without the mind moving in and making a humbug, just staying with it, things begin to change. One of two things will happen to us. You will either see the connection of events that led to that place so that you have the understanding of why it happened and it will fall away from you. Or you will in the moment begin to understand the appropriateness of the whole situation for this moment only, for this moment only, for this moment only. And every time this feeling arises, you just simply must stay totally and fully with it. You have tried many things to cure it. Now I think, and do whatever you wish, but curing means it's wrong, it's bad, I have to get rid of it. And I will tell you that you are far too wise and your soul far too vast to go through all of this for no reason. And all I ask you is to stay with the feeling of it and to, if you can, and this works for anyone who is really aware and wanting to move things, you have to begin to hear what is going on. And as you begin to just write, just write. Don't write great tones and frame them and put them on your walls, you know. That's not the kind of writing I mean. Just to write, to write, to allow the heat. You see, there's an explosion when the awareness touches this. Fully accepting. To, you see, the problem is you say, I fully accept this situation. I fully accept this. Well, that's the last thing that this motorcycle wants. This motorcycle wants us to put more gasoline in it to keep it going. You know what happens every time you put more gasoline in the, in the motorcycle? It just runs more and more and more. The only way it silences itself is when it runs out of gasoline. And when you stop running and just, I don't mean that you just lay down and say, I will have this forever. You simply stop and say, what is now? Now is I've got this feeling. And that's all you do. You don't go forward and say, well, I always... Do you, you understand? There's a difference of saying, I accept it in this moment totally and fully. That's different from saying, I'm going to have it forever and ever and ever. Do you understand the difference? The vital difference in consciousness. You have got to get that to accept this feeling. You see, the fear is you accept these feelings and you're stuck with them forever. And I tell you, it's the opposite. You accept them fully in the moment, and then the next moment, something else might come. But if you run, if you run, it'll chase you. It'll chase you, just like those poor cats with, with tin cans tied to their tails. It will chase you, clinging and clanking unto the end. In this moment, when you just, it's almost as if you embrace it fully. What a hideous thing to say. But to embrace it fully, the confusion, the fear, all of it. Just to embrace it, and that means not to think it, I'm thinking, I'm confused. That's not what I mean. Confusion is a word. Confusion felt in the body is a feeling. It, it has heat in the brain. I wish I could get you all instantly confused. Well, I could probably do that. <laughs> get you quickly and completely confused and say, then feel that. When we asked you to stop and feel your body after the dance, you must have felt differently than you would have if we'd done it this morning, didn't you? get a sense that there was something different going on than it would have this morning as we sat as in the cool of the morning and so on. Well, all and I'm talking about, not about a mental feeling, I am talking about a physical feeling. And when you simply sit and feel it in all of its pressures and describe it simply in feeling tones, heavy, hot, sharp, moving, tight, cool, whatever it comes, and just stay with it again and again, then you are stopping feeding gasoline to the motorcycle. But if you go into the mind and try to steam a healing or a way out or a way to change things or a way to make them different than they are, all of that is simply putting more energy into the situation and it goes on and on without any resolution. The resolution comes. Why do some people get healed instantly? 
something happens between the cells and the matrix and there is instant healing and it is absolutely possible that those feelings I know this is hideous to say they could be over by tomorrow but then one says if I give up my sorrow over the loss of my love then this means I never loved I don't want to give up my sorrow do you understand what I'm saying I'm talking for you I don't want to give up my sorrow because my sorrow is what makes me know I've loved my sorrow and my grief tell me that I'm a loving person and without sorrow without grief how do I know how do you know that you're loving I will tell you what a human says a human says you know that you love someone if when anything goes wrong your life almost ends and the deeper the love the deeper your grief and the longer the grief and the more your life becomes obscure and that is the human definition of loving someone do you understand that is how you decide whether you love someone is how painful it is when they're no longer there there is another point of view there's another point of view and once again now we're talking about a high end of a scale we're not talking about something in the middle but at the high end of the scale there is that funny terrible word again surrender that awful word and the human fights it no no hmm? no no if I surrender I'm stuck I'll never get out I'm done I'm finished it will win it will win you see it will win whatever it is the disease will win the grief will win the pain will win other questions about what to do with physical pain the question is the pain will win if I give in and relax and accept and surround it with surrendering it, it will win you see it's this, there's this when you begin to talk of human terms we almost always end up in some kind of a, of a combative situation the disease will win you see and I understand that but there is another point of view and it's way up here and it says and I for some of you this is going to be absolute nonsense but let's do it anyway there's another point of view that says look there is some vast magnificent awareness at work in all of this in every single part of it including my life including my choices including my life as it's spreading itself into the world now there is some deep meaning in it and my mind cannot grasp it my emotions run away from it and my body is paying the price of it where do I go for the clarity and the safety around these events and everyone in this room is going to have events just like this if you haven't already you know they're coming the question is why would you be exempt you know it happens to be part of the human condition and that's all right but to suffer without knowing what the whole point of it is is to truly suffer so the suggestion is simply this at the high side of all these events comes when you can say even if you say it with your teeth clenched and your face contorted and your whole being in some state of contraction you say I accept this exactly as it is and I'm going to sit in it until the clarity comes this is the Buddha sitting down under the Bodhi tree and saying I am not moving until I see the light and what you say is this event has power for me I have got to be clear about it and instead of thinking it I am going to simply feel it accept it feel it feel it don't think it don't idea it don't 
Just stay with the feeling. Don't even talk it. Just feel it and feel it day after day after day. And what happens is you begin to get it. You begin as the Buddha all of a sudden, he saw the clarity of it. Now, his was rather substantial, you know. He only saw, <laughs> he only saw 2,000 lifetimes, you see. Forget just one little event. You see, he said, my goodness, this really works. And here comes the show. 2,000 years of the Buddha going before him. All right. Now, that is the same thing that will happen to you when you begin to train yourself as he was training himself. And how do you train it? He, he, you simply stay with it. You, you know, the Buddha was great because he didn't think, you know, he didn't talk a lot about thinking. He, he just talked about what is. And he didn't speculate on a god, a good or a bad god. He just said, look, guys, we don't know. We're just right here under this tree, and there's me and this tree and this breath of mine, and that's all I've got, and the occasional bit of rice, and thank you very much, but that's all I've got, and I don't want any more theories. I don't want any more ideas. I certainly don't want any more spooks <laughs> talking. <laughs> what do I want? I want to know. I want knowing. I want clarity. I want the light. And when you just, you see, but that's not what you want. You want to get healed, somebody else, but you want something else. You want to get well. You want to have, you want to get your love back. You want to get your money back. You want to get, you want something. You know, and, and you want your health back. Well, that is later on. And the now is the now. Another way of saying it. The pain and the sorrow or the illness, the solution to all of it arises with it. It doesn't arise further in time. It arises with it. So if it's arisen with it, then why isn't it clear? Because I would like to say to you that most of you aren't looking for it. You're not really looking for the answer. You're looking, you know, you're not looking for the clarity. You're looking for a healing. Or you're looking for a return to a state that has perhaps no longer present. You're looking for something. And in this paradoxical situation, and when you get into the realm of transformation and transformative power, you're always in this realm they're paradoxical and what you're looking for is buried deeply within the situation itself not outside it not later on but deeply within it and when you turn the full power of your awareness on it you will get the clarity and you'll get the light and I want to tell you something my friends when you understand things when you understand things, they become very, very easy to live with. It is when you do not understand that anger and resentment and running from and so on comes in. Is this a difficult job? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Words can clarify and they can also cover over. Someone asked about breath. And all I want to say about breath is it is the great clarifier. When you bring awareness of your breath into each moment, as you go through each moment, things settle down very, very quickly. There is a translucency to breath that brings light to many things. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is constantly offending people because he is on aircraft going from place to place. And I'm assuming he goes first class. If not, he's very foolish, isn't he? to go first class and as he sits there he offends the people sitting next to him because all he wants to do is breathe but I'm quite sure that if 
anyone was paying attention to the feeling tone of his energy as he is breathing, one would not be offended. And as you are in your rooms tonight, and as if you have any sense of offending whoever is with you in that room, just be aware of your feeling of yourself as you breathe. Think of them in your mind as you're breathing. And remember an experience that many of you had this morning, when you first came this morning and greeted each other. In the absence of speech, many of you made the deepest connections you've made with the other person since you've met them. The words were not there. There was just the now. I would like to give you a frank answer to the question many of you ask, which is, why aren't you enlightened yet? Many of you say, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it all, I've done it all, I want it, I've read everything, I've done all this, 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 and why isn't it here? This entire day, with as many fingers pointing in the direction as we possibly can, we have been trying to make something very clear. For many people, enlightenment is a mental concept, a mental construct, an idea in their mind, and it is not becoming a reality within their physical body, which is where it's experienced. And the reason for that is that many of you have trained yourself to stay out of your body and stay into your mind and to, so you think the light, I think, you know, some people do mantra on light for years and they say, I've done it for years and years and years and I, I've never seen anything. It's all the same. What's happening? The entire exercise for tonight However you choose to work that, if you find that you simply cannot say that particular phrase, if somehow you are, you see, the problem is that if you really do not accept your body, then you are afraid by saying, I accept my body, that you're stuck with it in the shape that, in which it's in. Again and again, we go back to the truth of consciousness, which is that transformation takes place when that moment of accepting surrender that says, Today, this day, this body is this way. Or my emotions are this way. Or my feelings are this way. Or my health is this way. Or my confusion is this way. And that m accepting today's lot exactly as it is, is the key to the beginning of the descent of the light. When you settle down into your life today as it is, and one way of doing it is to say, I accept my body. Now, if it's stretching it too far <laughs> to, say, to say the phrase that we suggested, well, then do something that will work for you. But the idea of accepting the magnificent creation of this body and to really get into a cellular communication about it begins to have something very interesting happen to it. It begins to relax, and when the body begins to relax, the light begins to let go. The light begins to make itself known. It's the relaxing that brings about the dawning of the light. It is the struggling against and the looking for and the, all of that that sets up this current that is, uh, that is the antithesis of the light. And the reason for that is the light is calm. The light is calm. Never has anybody gotten in light and saying, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. This is too nerve-wracking for me. What do they say? They give you words like they are filled with an endless peace, an endless calm. A calm descended upon my being, and I knew all was well. No one says, I became so agitated, thank you, God. You see, it's a matter of understanding. <laughs> it's a matter of understanding what is required. And it is a relaxation. 
and the way that the cellular body relaxes around pain and sorrow and grief and illness and loss and lack and fear and future fear and past pain and whatever it is, is the cells have to do something. They have to shift. You're not going to get a... You know, <laughs> euphoria is felt in the cells. Euphoria is a cellular feeling. You never go around saying, ooh, I'm thinking euphorically. <laughs> you see, this is an incredible euphoric thought I'm having. You see? <laughs> it is a feeling. You feel euphoric. And you are looking, I don't care what you say, you're looking for euphoric feelings. And I want to promise you, there is no euphoric feeling to ever compare with the full, complete explosion of the light of God consciousness. Ever. Everything else pales. Is a pale, pale excitement. And it happens in the relaxation and in the letting go and into the full, full opening to the moment exactly as it is. Nothing has to be changed or taken away or added to it. And it is so simple that the confusing part of the mind, the part of the mind that loves to make things a little difficult, doesn't like to accept this. But all I can tell you is, as you begin to give these messages to the cellular constructs, what was suggested for, for this evening, you say, what has this got to do with my enlightenment to say to my body that I fully accept it? I want you to realize that if you did this and I use the word with, with humor, religiously, for the next week, <laughs> religiously, you would begin to feel in your body greater, greater vibrational frequency and a sense of moments of exaltation, a sense of everything being integrated and absolutely appropriate in a way that your mind will never grasp. You say, this planet and all that's going on is appropriate. Your mind says nuts. You, you can't be. But the being knows. And when the relaxation, which is of a cellular beginning, begins to happen with the accepting of it, moment after moment after moment after moment, then you find yourself just seated in quietness, just looking around, not wanting anything changed, not anything different. And all of a sudden, all of those majestic words that come from the enlightened ones begin to make sense. God's in God's heaven and all's right with the world. What? What? Those words were not spoken at some great, exalted, golden era of mankind. They were spoken at a time when there was tremendous difficulty on this earth plane. So how can it be that all's well, all's right with the world? How can this be? There is no answer in the mind. There is no formula to give you. There is just to finally stop where you are, sit down like the Buddha and say, I have looked everywhere for you, God. You are a very crafty thing. And I have looked everywhere. I have looked at every religion. I have looked under every rock. I have looked everywhere. I have looked everywhere. And now I'm sitting down, and I am going to begin to try to believe the concept that says, in everything, God is equally present. In everything, the light is equally manifest. In all of the created and non-created, there is the same amount of abundant light. And you just sit around... And if you want to talk about it this way, waiting for the proof to arrive. You just sit around waiting for the proof to arrive. And that means the surrender to the moment exactly as it is. That means listening to the sounds. This is a very easy thing. You listen to the sounds that rise and fall. You do not try to bring, you know... <laughs> I think that one problem about sound is that there are definite preferences to what sounds, you know, more than many things. I think taste and sound are the two things that humans have the greatest um, 
prejudice is about. You know, you have your taste buds down to a, to a fine art of the things that your taste buds enjoy and the taste buds don't. And of course, it gets in tremendous conflict with what you hear your body wants, but then there's those taste buds, you know, that they want this, and then the body should have this. And so we have this con tremendous struggle between the taste buds and the rest of the body, you see? And uh, the struggle is, is manifest everywhere. So taste, you have very, uh, very select, and in hearing, you're very select. You, endless time can be spent on what music and what food will be served at a party. Endless hours. Well, what music shall we put on? Well, let's see. At the beginning, we will put on this, and then in the middle, we will put on this, and then in the end, we put on this. And do you, you understand? This goes on because these are the two receptors that you are the most specialized about. Now, why is this difficult? Well, it doesn't matter. But where it becomes a problem, in quotes, uh, when uh, enlightenment is present, is that there has to come a time when you just simply allow all hearing to be present, as it is, that means motorcycles, that means whatever, just whatever, to just, to just create the openness to allow hearing. It is the way to be in the moment. The fastest way to be in the moment is breath and allowing hearing to just simply flow without any conditions. You can get in the moment in your apartment listening to the sound of the traffic Probably easier than you can sitting under, excuse me, sitting under a tree on a holy mountain with no sound. Because the sound of those motorcycles and the sound of the traffic, whatever, gets into you. It puts you right in the moment. And when you get things to be very, very, very special so that there's no action and no sound and so forth, most of the time you find you fall asleep. Most of the time you fall asleep. You make your life so special that you fall asleep. So just open to everything, every sound, whatever is going on. And as you begin to understand this, that being open to all sound is a gateway to the light, then you're going to want to do it with tremendous power and presence. Just listen. Just look. Just breathe. You say to me, that sounds boring. I'd rather think. If you are paying attention to your thoughts, they will probably bore you faster than your breathing, <laughs> than your breathing and your seeing. Because your thoughts are endlessly similar to each other. Remember, they, I don't know how they do this but they have tested and found out that 95% of the thoughts that you think today, you will think tomorrow. <laughs> that is a very interesting fact. <laughs> and I ask you to think about it in that that should be boring to you, but because you're not paying attention to the thought process, you keep this feeling that if you can just get the right series of thoughts, that you're going to, to uh, be more uh, loving or happier or whatever it might be. Back to the simplicity. All I ask you to do is to get the power of the moment. Simply seeing, simply hearing, simply breathing. When you walk, walk. Pay attention to the walk. When you sit, be aware of your sitting. When you speak, be aware of your speaking. Speak, feel it, Hear it, make it a complete moment. Whatever you do, do it simply, do it simply, do it simply, and pay attention to what is happening now. If you have a sensation, be aware of it. If you're eating, please taste it. If your hand is holding a cup, feel it. Feel your body. Feel the entire experience of yourself. It is in that simplicity that you're going to find what you're looking for. It is not hidden in some mysterious place and that you have to go and find it. I stated before and I will say again, this thing that you are looking for is so big and so obvious and so ever-present and so familiar that you have missed it. 
It isn't that it's so strange and difficult and hidden. It is that it's so familiar and present and obvious that you've missed it. Where can it be if it is not here? What can it be if it is not something already being experienced and aware of now? What can it be? Is this light something that only exists in the higher heavens? And this is somehow the low bardos? You're intelligent. Use your brains. What kind of a God is it that says, all right, I'm going to have this creation, and down at the bottom is going to be all this bad business, and up at the top is going to be all this good business, and your job is to get from the bad business to the good business, but I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going to give you any directions except confusing ones. I will create how many religions, and you pick, and then you get confused and whatever, and it'll take you lifetime after lifetime. This is not a God creation, this confusion. It is either here, now, available, ever-present, or I don't know anything about it. Or you are looking for something that I know nothing about. But if you are looking for what I assume you're looking for, which is a total transcendent bliss in your being every moment, which is a pulsating power and excitement by just being alive, by just feeling a warmth that transcends warmth moving out of your heart that embraces everything in the entire createdness. If that's what you're talking about, then I understand where to get that. Anything else I know nothing about. And that is here and now, ever-present and available. Someone asked the question, why am I sad? I'm not sad, I'm intense. And, <laughs> and intensity has an edge to it. And the reason I'm intense is we're running out of time. As you look at this planet, and as you open yourself to all of the change, you come to know that now is the choice. As you open yourself, and I am talking about moment to moment to moment to moment, not a half an hour every morning and half an hour every night. I am talking about an ongoing commitment to the opening and the allowing of light and if you visualize it in your body coming in, that's fine. If that doesn't do it for you, if you just stop and feel the expansion of the silence in the majesty of each moment, it is ever present, it is immense, it is there as well. If you, whatever way you honor that and complete it within your physical body and not just in your mind, you will have made the beginnings and the continuation and the ending of the transition between one who is asleep and one who is awake. We are asking for awakened awareness. And we don't care how you get there. So as you take on the sweet, magnificent responsibility of selecting your moment-to-moment -moment way and the path that you're going to walk, if you don't feel comfortable with the path, then don't walk on a path. Fly up in the sky and just be present. Just be present with the ever-presence. You don't have to have somebody yanking you along. You are your own motivator and you are your own transformer. And at the same time, I want you to know that there is more help available from the unseen world now than you can possibly imagine. In the most magnificent, empowered, and closely aligned awarenesses, and it's happening now. If we have ever had a crucible of consciousness, it is happening now. Are, they, are the 60s tied up with it? You bet. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Without the 60s, this could not have happened. This could never have happened. 
You're on your way. But don't stop. And for heaven's sake, don't think you have forever. One of the things that has to be stated, we stated on it yesterday, let's extend it a bit, is that as time is moving faster, so are what we would call windows. The windows come and go faster at the same time. Does that make any sense to you? The windows into openings, into awarenesses. And as the energy gets faster and more, more dynamic and more alive, so then is the motion much faster. And so I'm telling you, I would ask you, and I rarely say this, get, don't expect... No, I, I better not say that. I hope you're all on the 10-year plan. <laughs> I hope you're all on the 10-year plan. I want, you know, everybody says, well, I've got my whole lifetime. And then, of course, we have the other point of view. Well, if I don't make it this lifetime, I'll make it next, next lifetime. How do you know how long you'll have to wait for a next lifetime? It's now. You've got the equipment. You've got the information. You've got the focus. You've got the light. You've got the power. Then let's do it. Every time you put down that foot, every time you are aware of breath, every time you coordinate the breath and the feet and the remembrance and the total remembrance, it matters. Those moments are absolutely gem-like and they matter. And you accumulate them and make great and wondrous strings of necklaces around the neck so that you become the bearer of the light and they happen moment to moment as you gather these moments of pure conscious awareness. And as you become light, as you become aware of light, as you become extended, dynamic, creative power of consciousness, so then do you move out and help all that is around you. One of the questions was, how can one find one's job, the assignment one has, and the power to do it? My answer is this, what we have just talked about. All of you have something to do. And you will find out what it is and have the power and the commitment to do it as you accumulate ever, ever more garlands of light. And you do this by things like what we are going to do right now, by opening and surrendering and allowing that which is ever manifest to make itself manifest clearly for you. And then you become the way and the truth and the light. And in turn, others become the way and the truth and the light. It's a handing the light on endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Now those, if someone asked about crop circles, and this, strangely enough, is where crop circles fit in. So just a little side. Do you all know what crop circles are? Does anybody not know? All right, then uh, all over the world, but mostly um, in the certain parts of, of Great Britain over the last few years, uh, over a thousand, well, there have been thousands now, of, of, of uh, shapes formed overnight uh, in the fields of the farmers uh, before harvest time. And they began the first year very simply circles within circles and so forth. And then they became more and more elaborate. And now they can be, uh, you know, uh, two football fields in length and very intricate and very beautiful. And, of course, uh, Great Britain is in a great state of confusion because what are they? Who, who causes them? Um, and interestingly enough, little sideline here, is the British government preferred to think it was UFOs than the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> because the alternative, at least if it's a UFO, then it's another created uh, something interacting with the Earth, which then brings about something that you see. The idea that something unseen, 
because nothing is seen. Now, if you've been to Great Britain, you understand that these fields are right alongside of these, of these uh, farmers' homes, and they all have sheep dogs and dogs and so forth, and there's no activity at the night. The dogs don't bark. Nothing happens. Nothing is, you know, sometimes mysterious lights are seen that are so mysterious that that frightens people as well. So there seems to be an unknown factor going on here, and the stuff, you know, farmer stumbles on in the morning, he looks at it and goes, oh my God, because he has two choices, either plows it very quickly, or else everybody just tramples his, his crop, you see. <laughs> and so they began to charge admission, and you understand, they're losing, they're u losing, uh, you know, people coming through, and, and then of course all the New Agers are standing in the middle and oming and chanting and doing all this business, and, and then they have the whole scientific community, which is very excited about it, and so they've listened and they hear clickings that are only heard on very intricate devices. Something is afoot. All right. Now, where this fits is this. Now, here comes our theory. All right. Good. We'll see. What was experienced when a group of Americans went to Great Britain and stood in such a circle was this. There are vast energy fields underground. Almost all of these circles, at least the ones in Great Britain, are appearing by very old, ancient power sites. Either the Barrows or the uh, wonderful, there are many of them, near Stonehenge, uh, they're near Glastonbury, they're near Avebury, they're, they're near the Tors, they're near all of those wondrous ancient sites. Merlin's home, you know, things like that, going way back into all the myths of, of that. Well, what was experienced is that there's tremendous power near all of these sites, and what we would like to suggest is it's a coming together of two things. It's an activating of an existing power that is underneath, and you can tell, you see, you get over there, and then you, we, we just handed everybody these, these little coat hangers and said, well, you know, douse it for yourself. And so here are all the, it's wonderful, all the, all the, you know, the great disbeliever is handed, someone gets handed one of these little coat hangers, and he or she starts walking down this, this row that is supposed to have certain parameters within its holiness and so on, yes, 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 and all of a sudden the thing starts to move and, and they know that they're not doing it. And there's nothing like on hands experience to, to, <laughs> to put you in a, at least a questioning frame of mind. So when in the midst of these circles, it's very clear to see where the, where the focus of the circle is and the power and so on. The, the idea put forth here is that there is a coming together of two areas a coming together of an external power that is placing itself on the land itself and is responding. Things are happening on both levels. Something coming up from below, something joining from, excuse me, coming up from the bottom and joining from the top. And these have something to say, and in the next few years, perhaps they'll crack the code. It's uh, very exciting times, and um, it's worth keeping your eye on as the, I mean, it's not going to, you know, well, I don't know what it's going to do. Let's not say let's not. Uh, anyway, uh, exciting and, and, and something very important being transmitted. Now, physical pain is the last cry about an event or about a belief or about a state of um, confusion. It's the last cry. Uh, it manifests often in the beginning time in dreams, uh, then it comes down to mind and thought, and then finally, if nothing is, if none of that catches the, the focus of the conscious mind, then the body takes on the, the, uh, the, excuse me, the delightful task of being the messenger. Now, what I think would be most important for you is to take this pain just in that way as something that is in the first place, a gift for an understanding, a gift for... M most time, pain comes about because of constriction, because of contraction. And contraction comes about because of fear. Fear either understood or fear future or real fear about to be felt. Now, all fear is not lack, does not have uh, no basis to it. Much fear has a base to it. But when one understands what you're dealing with, then it becomes something you can handle. So what I would suggest to you, lovely one, is that you begin to address it in the, in the deepest way uh, as, you, as you, you must make this 
pain as real for you as you can. That means you have got to give it, you've got to give it a shape, it has to have color, it has to have size, it has to, ha it has to have, uh, whether it's hot or cold, whether it feels liquid and, and uh, uh, mobile, moving around a lot, whether it's viscous, whether it's porous, this pain is a real thing. It is not just, you know, it's just not a matter of, of some kind of chemical uh, composition or cellular uh, uh, construct. It's, it's it, an energy of moving in and, and connecting with the cellular features. And when you get that practical with it, it, it's as if you take it and you sit it down and you say, all right, now let us, let us be in relationship to it deeply. Now, if you have a good friend, which I think you do, if you have a good friend who is willing to take you through it, then you lay down, you become very, have you done this? All right, you lay down, you become very aware of it, you allow it to really burn you, it, uh, whatever it does to you, you allow it to be very real. You say the words, uh, it's hot, it's this, it's that, until you feel it. Don't, please don't just do it for 15 minutes and then walk away. Give yourself time where nothing else is happening. <coughs> and as that, as it becomes real and the shape, don't forget the shape and the heaviness and the weight and the porousness of this, whatever is there. And you just go, uh, even if you s think you're silly, just do it, do it, do it until it's very, very real. And then the questioner, whoever, you know, the questioner comes and states what is needed to release or dissolve this and things will begin to suggest themselves. And I want you please to be as outrageous, as, uh, un, you know, as undisciplined as possible, uh, whatever it needs to be said, just to say it. And what begins to happen is if this is successful, there is a shift. There's a feeling of an actual physical shift in the body that takes place, all right? Out of that shift, things will begin to move. Things will begin to rise, uh, alternatives, uh, suggestions, solutions, dreams. Um, the energy then is released and then there's greater space. Now, what is not helpful about pain, and it's very difficult to avoid it, is the fear that arises. The fear is both a primary and a tertiary source. For example, the thing that rises first is fear. The second thing that comes in is uh, the pain, and then the pain itself brings about fear. Does everybody understand? We're talking about a sandwich here, you see. <laughs> and so we have the pain on the bottom, and we ha uh, excuse me, we have the fear on the bottom that gives rise, and then we have the, the, the pain in the center, and then overlaying it is fear that arises out of the pain. Gosh, am I ever going to get rid of this? How does it come from? Well, this is getting worse. I can't, <laughs> endless. All right, now, so we have the, 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 tertiary, the, the third and the first are both the same, but in the middle is this other funny little uh, attention getter. I, I don't mean to make it smaller than you might feel it, but it's an attention getter. Not that you want to get attention of other, I'm talking about trying to get your attention. And so as that, be, and the, what's going to happen when you, get, when you get very intimate with the pain, it's going to reveal the primary source, which is what is fearful in there. And I want you, please, to allow yourself to say anything. She's totally trustworthy to say anything that comes to mind, no matter how rambunctious, no matter how uh, whatever. And if you need to record it on a tape recorder, do so so she has a direct translation of it. And just work with it. And it, sometimes this can happen in one, one session. And if you really understand the concreteness necessary, then th that will deepen it. All right? and then do all the other things that one does. But I, understanding that it comes as the absolute beloved messenger to try to, to, to get the release of what it stands upon, which is the fear. And in your case, it is very possible that you might begin to see images, you know, just concrete images. Describe them in as much detail as you can. Again, don't be vague. Get the color, get the feeling tone. Is it, is it d light, is it dark, is it raining, is it dour, is it what's happening, what's ha what are you wearing, what's
get as concrete with it. These are real images and they have real power behind them. You know, my friends, all right? The inner world is real. It is uh, as real as the outer world, in some ways more real, uh, but you're not trained in the, in the journeys uh, within. And uh, many of you are getting trained, and good, good for you. You're getting trained on inner, <coughs> inner journeys and how, how to know a real journey from a false one. And there is one absolute clue between a real journey and a false one. If a change takes place, even if you don't get rid of the difficulty, if a shift takes place in your point of view about it, congratulations, she did it, you see, always does, thank you. A shift in point of view about it, which releases and allows it to happen without that same intensity around it, gets very big, air there, space there, there's more room, I can make bigger changes, I can make bigger choices, I'm not stuck with only one response, I have a a world full of possible responses to this event. One is good. <laughs> Surprising, isn't it? <laughs> well, good. I wonder what's next. Understand? All right. Other responses. I bet it, so stay with it. All right. I, I pray that you leave today and begin to ask yourself, in what way is my body magnificent? In what way is my body magnificent? If we have time, maybe after the break we'll try this. But if not, then in what way am I grateful for this body? In what way is it magnificent? And when you begin to look, it, they will come out just this fast. And you will see that you have projected an idea of perfection on the body and being forced it to meet that perfection, which it cannot do, which it cannot do. All bodies were not supposed to look like Bo Derek or who's the other one? Some man, who was that? some wonderful man. Give me one. Robert Redford. What? Tom Selleck. Tom Selleck. All right. Robert Redford. One of them. Who? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, never mind. <laughs> Anyway, do you understand? They weren't meant to, and that's not appropriate. I'm, but I'm saying this deeply because it comes up like that. And so the poor body is saying, well, I'm doing the best I can. If you'd let me, I might do better than this. You know, but you, anyway, I'm asking for a deep rapport with the body. And, um, and then you begin to feel the integrity, and you wake up in the morning with this incredible joy, because without, without the body, realization is not possible. You see, you don't have to realize your soul. Your soul is fully realized. <laughs> you don't have to realize your light. The light is fully realized. So what's left? What's left is this amalgam that is crammed into the physical body, and it's where it's going to happen. It's not going to happen out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. When you begin to say that, uh, then it begins to hear it in a different way. It begins to relax in a different way. It begins to open. It begins to sigh with relief, you know, uh, that you're finally going to stop it, you see. Phew. Good, good, you know. And all of a sudden, things begin to hum, and you begin to experience well-being. Instead of looking well, you begin to experience well-being. I would make a trade there any day. I would make a trade any day. But you have to ask yourself if you would. Would you trade well-being for looking well? Because much of the emphasis is not even on feeling well, but looking well. A far cry from, you know, it's interesting because so many of the really magnificent God-realized ones in their facial alignments are not really you know, handsome or beautiful. I mean, Mother Teresa, <laughs> okay, Mother Teresa, and yet to be in her presence, as I hope some of you will be, I understand there's a wonderful conference coming and she's going to be in it with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and some great, yes, I hope you're all interested, it should be great, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, it should be a wonderful coming together, and I know nothing about it, <laughs> so over to who does. Great. So maybe in the afternoon, if you at the close, you could represent that information. Sounds like a wonderful moment, and I think they will all be beautiful. 
I think they will all be beautiful in very different ways, just beautiful, full of beauty. The question about if God is in everything, why pick nonviolence over violence, good over evil, light over darkness? In two minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, we have to approach this from different levels. Because on one level, as we spoke of yesterday, it is absolutely your destiny to get to the place where you can look upon, I didn't say choose, I said look upon good and evil, light and dark, violence, non-violence, with the same steady, compassionate gaze. And that means to be able to look upon it and not have that wrenching judgment that comes up out of being, this dichotomy between the, the animal kingdom and the, and the magnificence of the transcendence. You see, you stand in a very interesting position the human psyche, you know, and you stand on two feet, and one is here and one is here, and the world of the gold and the light and the wonder and the power and the, and the perfection, and over here in the animal with all of its magnificent uh, creative exploration and uh, dynamic uh, life. <coughs> it's very, it's, 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 it's wonderful. And um, one way to talk about life here is that the balance is getting so that it's much more equal-handed, so that you're not way over here or you're not way over here. As long as you're in the body, you're going to get the balance. When it's time to be way over here, on this side, you will leave body form and choose not to return and pick another reality in which to inhabit. There are many of them. But at the same time, It is absolutely, it's, it's almost impossible for me to imagine that in, a, in a, an illumined one, or a close to be illumined one, or a seeker of the light, a true seeker of the light, to choose violence over nonviolence. While it is absolutely true that there is as much creative God principle in one act as there is in another, there is also a knowing that if one is to choose, one would choose to act, because you see, acts beget acts, beget acts, beget acts. One act begets another, begets another, begets another. So the minute that you, that you act and beget an act of kindness and love and compassion and wholeness and fullness, you set up a pattern of the ripples that sets up another, yet another, yet another. You cannot do an act of violence and hope to have it, an act of love and compassion come out of it, my friends. You're talking about two different streams. You just can't. So whatever is the beginning initiator of the act begets others, others, you understand? It goes out and out and out and out, propagates itself, plays upon itself, makes itself vaster, deeper, and expansive. And given which of those you want to create, I think you understand, without letting the mind fool you and the statement that it, they're both equal, uh, what one usually chooses to create is the acts of love and compassion and wonder and expansion. Now, if they're equal in Godness, then what's, what's, the, uh, what's the difference? You all know the difference. You feel the difference. You feel when you act in a loving, open, compassionate, abundant, dynamic, creative way. You feel a greater pulsation of a, of, a, of a peaceful, calming magnificence. At the same time, it is absolutely true that the perpetrator of the violence is using the absolute same basic substance and source 
which is creative consciousness, to create its acts. But remember the basic, the basic dynamic of consciousness. Please hear this. Given its own pattern, given its own openness to create what it will, beingness always moves toward beauty, harmony, and bliss. Always. The nature of being allowed to move in its own way always moves toward beauty, harmony, and bliss. It's a difficult question, so I hope that satisfies you. Right. When I last, when I saw you last, I went home and the next night felt a kiss on my forehead and you said goodbye. Told me to look at the sky and I saw a shooting star. Mm. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> All right, let's talk about this because um, a lot of people have. Uh, Mary Margaret slash Bartholomew dreams. It's kind of hard to dream about Bartholomew without somehow putting, you know, this body into it. It is possible. Many people have had uh, dreams that have absolutely the feel and the knowing, and they know, and it's not, Mary Margaret is not, uh, and the physical form is not present. All right. It is the greatest joy and delight of any, I don't know quite what to call all of this, any teacher uh, is a difficult word. How about elder brother? Let's just go with that. Teacher uh, applies, implies more knowledge here than there, and that's, that's illusory. Let's just say I'm older than you are which all of you will be happy to know. <laughs> it is always the delight of the elder brother or sister, whatever, who has in any way had a part of the, of the guiding, um, of the either brother or sister, to have that one come to the place where they no longer need the guidance because um, there's a shooting star out there because there is a shooting star is a wonderful kind of an image um, shooting stars uh, on the earth plane are associated with the death of teachers And they are often seen in the sky when bona fide teachers die. It was certainly the, the case when the Buddha left. It was the case when Ramana Maharshi left. There have been many wonderful saints and just magnificent beings, both in, in Buddhism, whose names are unpronounceable, uh, and in Hinduism, and on their death there's a shooting star observed. And we know that this teaching is going to die in its way, and I think it's um, a wonderful kind of a, of a salute and a goodbye. And <coughs> at the same time, um, there's always something better. There's always something bigger. There's always something more expensive. So, so of course, the prayer for all of you is that it's something much bigger, much vaster, much more, whatever you seek. Uh, and 
tremendous gratitude for what we have, what we have shared and will share for a while longer.